Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine, where we try to make keeping up with the literature as easy as possible by spoon-feeding you the latest research. Now then, let's take a quick look ahead at everything that we've covered from this past week. You've been told twice now by us that you probably suck at the HINTS exam, but I'm here to tell you today that that need not be the case. Then a quick look on how to cauterize nosebleeds using silver nitrate. After that, COVID has us all on high alert for clotting. Let's talk about cerebral venous thrombosis. Then forget POCUS for just a second, let's assess heart function with a CT. And then finally, we end it all off with the D-dimers in pregnancy, can we even trust them? This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by the hardworking Andy Hogan, Vivian Lay, Megan Breed, Megan Hilbert, Rebecca White, and our lovely leader, Clay Smith. So without further ado, I bring you the first article, which was titled Differentiating Central from Peripheral Causes of Acute Vertigo in the Emergency Department Setting with the Hints, Standing, and ABCD2 Tests, a Diagnostic Cohort Study out of the Journal of Academic Emergency Medicine. There have been a few studies in the last little while that have demonstrated that emergency physicians are no good at applying or performing techniques like the HINTS exam to evaluate peripheral versus central vertigo, whereas neurologists are actually pretty great with these tools. It's important that we do a good job of evaluating these complaints because differentiating posterior circulation strokes from peripheral vertigo is really hard and 10 to 30% of these strokes are actually missed in the emergency department. What's the difference between an emergency department physician and a neurologist though, honestly? It's training, that's it. And we ED docs, heck, we can be trained too. This study was from a single center analyzing 300 prospectively enrolled emergency department patients presenting with vertigo. All of them underwent hints and standing exams. Now, both of these tests are acronyms if you're not familiar with them. HINTS stands for head impulse, nystagmus, and test of skew, while standing is a far inferior acronym if you ask me, which stands for spontaneous or positional, nystagmus, direction, head impulse test, and standing. So both are a list of things that you need to evaluate when trying to decide between central or peripheral vertigo. The hints and standing exams were administered by study team members with six hours of dedicated training on both of these techniques. And then the confirmatory test was an MRI. With the training, the hints exam in the hands of emergency physicians was quite sensitive at nearly 97% for central vertigo, which rose to 98% when non-stroke etiologies of central vertigo were excluded. That gives a negative predictive value of 99.4%. And this suggests that a patient with overall peripheral findings on exam, on the HINTS exam, has a very low chance, less than 1%, of having a posterior circulation stroke. The standing exam, which actually uses Frenzel glasses to help you evaluate for nystagmus, and these are these kind of Coke bottle glasses that make your eyes look huge and this helps you see nystagmus. Anyways, the standing exam didn't do as well. A sensitivity of 93%, but it did manage to be more specific, but only at 75%, so not tremendously specific. So yeah, I like this. As long as no one tries to run with this and start like some kind of for-profit certification process for doing vertigo examinations, ah, that would be a nightmare. Anyways, in a spoonful, with a little help from our friends, emergency physicians can indeed perform the hints or standing exams with very high sensitivities. Now, this was just a single center study, though, so maybe the people at this hospital are unreasonably good at evaluating vertigo. It's hard to tell. I'd like to see this replicated. Then from the second study, nasal cauterization with silver nitrate for recurrent epistaxis out of the New England Journal of Medicine. We are back on it with epistaxis, and you know what? Now that I think about it, I think I've covered more journal feed articles on epistaxis than I've actually seen people come into the ER at this point. That doesn't mean it's not common, though, so we have to be way fresh up on our skills. I mean, come on, guys, it's it, their nosebleeds. So let's review a good go-to technique, cautery with silver nitrate. As always, the first step in epistaxis is going to be to pinch that nose for 15 to 20 minutes without peeking. No peeking, don't peek. In the meantime, many patients might be able to answer a few questions of yours, so you can prep for the next steps and get some history from them to know if they have a bleeding disorder or if they at least have a family history of one. Any active or recurrent anterior epistaxis is going to be a candidate for cauterization, so you'll want to get a few things handy in order to do this. 
a nasal speculum if you have one, a light source of some kind, then it's also nice to numb the area. And you can do this by soaking a cotton ball in lidocaine, plus or minus a vasoconstrictor like oxymethazoline. And let that sit for about 10 minutes in the nasal cavity. Then get out those long spaghetti sticks with heavy metal tips that look like matches. Of course, I'm referring to silver nitrate applicators. And once you've identified what you expect to be a culprit vessel, you should cauterize along its entire length and the mucosa surrounding it as well. It's worth noting that it's not recommended that you cauterize both sides of the septum, as this could lead to perforation. If the vessel is actually actively bleeding, then silver nitrate cauterization isn't going to work very well though, so you should still be planning for the next steps in treatment, which is probably going to be packing. In a spoonful, my biggest takeaway from this is to cauterize around the vessel and the entire vessel. This should hopefully help you reduce recurrent bleeding. If you subscribe to the New England Journal of Medicine, then they actually have a good video that walks you through most of the procedure. But they don't actually show you the cauterization process itself, just the preparation and the results. I found that pretty disappointing. I get that it's hard to film, but still, guys. Anyways, we can move on to the third article, which was Cerebral Venous Thrombosis out of the New England Journal of Medicine. This next one, I feel like I've heard a lot about this lately, and it's not obvious, so it could easily be missed. It's just one of those things that's got to be in the back of your mind and isn't going to do anything obvious on presentation to stand out and tell you, hey, this patient has a cerebral venous thrombosis, so always consider it. There are a few types of different venous thromboses, and they are differentiated based on their location. Dural venous sinus thrombosis will most commonly present with a headache, but without specific features, so it can vary quite a bit patient to patient. If there's infarction, then you might expect some more obvious signs, like seizures or neurological deficits, which at least will point you in the direction of an intracranial process. After that, we have cavernous sinus thromboses, which tend to cause headaches in the periorbital or forehead regions. You might also recall that cranial nerves 3, 4, 2 branches of 5, and 6 pass through the cavernous sinus, so deficits in these nerves are also pretty common. Then lastly, we have the cortical vein thromboses. These are actually exceedingly rare and typically are caused by extension of another thrombus, but these more commonly present with focal neurological deficits. The diagnosis of these clots are going to be made by CT or MRI, ideally with contrast-enhanced venography so that you can highlight that clot. Classically, you can see the empty delta sign in the dural sinus thrombosis cases. And this is empty because there should be contrast there, but there isn't because there's a clot there. And if there's no contrast, then you can see a hyperdensity in this region sometimes if the clot is acute. Anything that increases your risk of clots that includes COVID puts you at risk for any of these pathologies. So keep cerebral venous thrombosis in your differential for any patient at risk for clots who have a headache or neurological deficits. There isn't great agreement on the best treatment, but either way, it's probably going to be anticoagulation, generally with heparin or low molecular weight heparin. In a spoonful, patients at high risk for clots who present with headaches or neurological deficits could have a thrombosis in the cerebral venous system. The best tests are CTs or MRIs with contrast-enhanced venography. And so we go on to Article 4, Detection of Right Ventricular Dysfunction in Acute Pulmonary Embolism by Computed Tomography or Echocardiography, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis out of the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Okay guys, let's be honest, you'll be getting a CT chest on almost all the patients that you seriously consider have a PE. While you're doing that, determining the severity of the PE is very important. On a normal day, in most articles, I would point you towards POCUS for assessing the severity of a PE, you want to look at their heart. You'll be wanting to look at the classic signs too, you know, like McConnell's sign. Anyways, POCUS is a learned skill though. It takes time to develop that expertise, and as a result, unfortunately, not all of us are proficient. I am absolutely certain, though, that every emergency doctor at every level of training can order the heck out of his CT scan, though, and the heart is always going to be included in your CT chest. So what information can that give us? This article was a systematic review and meta-analysis to assess the diagnostic accuracy of CT to identify right ventricular dysfunction compared with a comprehensive echo. 
The CD finding with the most sensitivity for right ventricular dysfunction was the RV to LV ratio, which had a sensitivity of 83%, though the I-square value was a similar number at 82%, and that's quite a bit of heterogeneity. The most specific finding was septal deviation, with a specificity of 98%, and here the I-square value was just 47%. Not too bad. Now, it's important to note that this study was not targeted at the emergency department setting. So if you're proficient in POCUS, then I would urge you to have a good look there. If you're not, though, then you can get a helping hand that's actually pretty accurate. For the inpatient world, this might even eliminate the need for many formal echoes. In a spoonful, this study was able to identify the CD findings of RV to LV ratio as sensitive for right ventricular dysfunction and septal deviation as specific for right ventricular dysfunction in the context of a PE. This, of course, matters because they're predictive of poor outcomes. So maybe when you ask for the scan, if you want to know that information, include it in the requisition. And finally, we have our last article, which was titled D-Dimer to Rule Out Venous Thromboembolism During Pregnancy, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis out of the Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. On the long list of things that could put your patient at risk for a VTE is the joy of bringing life into this world. Pregnancy. It's also a leading cause of mortality in pregnancy, so you want to keep your eyes out. Now, since science has historically been very sexist, and people are way too afraid of being blamed for anything going wrong in pregnancy, pregnant patients have, you know, tended to be excluded from most research. Ordering a deep dimer, though, is pretty safe, and it could potentially exclude some patients from needing investigations that could pose a risk to fetus or the mother, though a single scan is widely considered to be safe, just to preface that. This study was a systematic review and meta-analysis that included four studies to encompass over 800 patients to assess D-dimers as a rule-out test for VTE in pregnant and postpartum populations. All included patients had a low or intermediate pretest probability according to a clinical decision tool, or in one study where there were no tools used, they had any pretest probability. The reference standard was an ultrasound, CTPA, or VQ scans at baseline or at three-month follow-up. The overall sensitivity for D-dimers in this population was 99.5%, with a negative predictive value of 100%. Those are the kind of numbers that we're looking for. The failure rate, which here was the number of patients who had a VTE at three-month follow-up despite a negative D-dimer, was 1 in 312 patients, or 0.32%. I would consider that acceptable. VTEs were present in 7.4% of the population, and a total of 34% of patients had a negative D-dimer. The next step in this research, which I'd like to see, is whether or not it's appropriate to adjust the D-dimer cutoffs because of pregnancy. We already do it for age, and it works pretty well. This might be another opportunity. Either way, as it stands, D-dimers are poised to save about one-third of low-risk patients from being scanned. I'd consider getting a D-dimer. In a spoonful, D-dimer can indeed be used to safely rule out a VTE in low-risk pregnancy patients, much in the same way that you would use a D-dimer in anyone else. All right, guys, that wraps us up. That's everything that we have to cover today. Let's do a quick review just to solidify some of those points. First off, we saw that we're not hopeless. Emergency physicians can effectively use the HINTS exam. After six hours of training, these physicians achieved a negative predictive value of 99.4% with the HINTS exam. Pretty good. Then from the second article, quick and easy, it's silver nitrate cautery for epistaxis, which is done by really isolating that vessel and burning the whole thing. Third, we spend most of our time worrying about the occlusion of the cerebral arterial system, but the venous system can clot also. So if you suspect it, then get a venous phase scan. Fourth, it never actually occurred to me that I would be wasting such a great data point here. Your CT chest can help assess right ventricular dysfunction in the context of PE. The RV to LV ratio is the most sensitive finding, and the septal deviation is the most specific. And then finally, from the last article, pregnant patients are people too, and so you can treat them like pretty much anybody else. D-dimers are still a useful rule-out test for VTEs in these patients, and it could save as much as one-third of patients from being scanned. 
Now then, that wraps us up. That's everything we have to cover absolutely from this week. But remember that you've earned them and we offer them. See Me Credits provided through a partnership with Hippo Education. All the details for that are at thejournalfeed.org, where if you'd like to, you're also welcome to sign up for our newsletter, where you can get daily spoon feeds through your email. Our goal here at The Journal Feed is to provide better patient care through spoon feeding. And so we're trying to help you keep up with the latest research, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.